Hi, my name is Caroline Bommel. I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon at New England Eye Center in Boston, and I'm also a professor of ophthalmology at Tufts University School of Medicine. Today, I'm going to be presenting about OCT angiography imaging in diabetic retinopathy, focusing on proliferative diabetic retinopathy. My disclosures are listed below. A few disclaimers to present. First, I'm being compensated by Zeiss to give this talk today. The statements in this talk are my personal opinion and also that not all of the products or services that are in this talk may be available in every market. So please check with your Zeiss representative. Just one slide on the basics. What is OCT angiography? Well, OCT angiography is a novel imaging modality to visualize flow in the microvasculature by detecting motion contrast from moving blood cells. It provides three-dimensional images of the retina, choriocapillaris, and choroidal vasculature. There's no dye injection, so it's faster than dye-based fluorescein or ICG angiography. Also, due to this, it's repeatable at every patient visit. Images are sharp and not obscured by dye. On the con side, it does require high-speed instruments. Sometimes very slow flow or flow impairment may not be detected. It does not assess dynamic vascular permeability. There can be artifacts related to OCTA imaging, so images may require careful interpretation. And it is a little bit slower than structural OCT. Now, one of the previous cons about OCT angiography when it first came out was that a more limited area of retinal coverage was available in the imaging. However, now there are larger area OCTA protocols and these larger OCTA scans are really critical for assessment of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and I'll be talking about this today. This is to show one of the benefits of OCT angiography is that it allows us to segment the retinal layers so we can see the distinct capillary networks that are around the fovea. And this was not possible with dye-based fluorescein angiography. This is to show another image of high definition OCT angiography with swept source OCTA. And now we can look at images using 100 kilohertz or 200 kilohertz laser source. And we can see on both images that capillary non-perfusion, microaneurysms, and an irregular FAZ size are present. But looking at the image on the right with the 200 kilohertz source, the image is very crisp and clear. And this speed allows very fast imaging. I wanted to show this because all of the OCTA machines have different protocols for imaging. And there's a huge variety of protocols available. And this has become one of my more recent favorite protocols to do on patients who are diabetics. This is a 15 by 15 millimeter OCTA scan on the left. And on the right is a high definition structural OCT. And I find this gives me a lot of information quickly about my diabetic patients. Just in brief, OCT angiography and diabetic retinopathy. What have we learned so far and what's left? So there's always so much more to know, but so far we have learned that we can evaluate flow in the retina and choroid in diabetic retinopathy eyes. And there have been changes and areas of non-perfusion noted. There have also been a lot of research on the fovea vascular zone, looking at differential changes in the superficial and deep capillary plexus, and looking at the size and how this correlates with the level of diabetic retinopathy. We've also found that OCTA has been able to detect early microvascular changes in diabetics who do not have clinical diabetic retinopathy. We've learned about microaneurysms, OCT angiography may be a potential non-invasive screening test for diabetics. And we've also evaluated multiple quantitative parameters such as vessel density that might identify risk for diabetic retinopathy progression. So 
This is an interesting image looking at an overlay of microaneurysms on fluorescein. And these are present. This is image A. This is fluorescein angiography. And we can see the white microaneurysms. In the same eye, image B is the OCT angiography image of the same eye. And in C, the fluorescein and OCTA images are overlaid, showing that regions of microaneurysms do correspond to small microaneurysms on OCTA. However, there are some differences looking at fluorescein and OCTA of microaneurysms, and that's because fluorescein is dynamic and the dye can pool in the microaneurysms over time, while OCTA is static, showing the image at that moment. And so if there's very slow flow or stagnant flow in a microaneurysm, it might not be shown. OCTA has also been able to detect vascular changes in eyes that did not have clinical signs of diabetic retinopathy. And this is really exciting. And in our center, we looked at a series of eyes and we found that parameters such as the mean foveolar vascular zone size, remodeling of the foveolar vascular zone, capillary non-perfusion, subtle microaneurysms, and vessel tortuosity might be present in patients who are diabetic but didn't have clinical signs of diabetic retinopathy. So this might have clinical utility in the future to identify who is at risk for developing diabetic retinopathy and deciding when people need to have eye examinations. Here's another image showing that in eyes who have different degrees of diabetic retinopathy, the foveal avascular zone measured around the superficial capillary plexus and in the deeper capillary plexus may be differentially affected. So what sort of scan protocol do I do when I see my patients? This is a patient I just saw the other day in clinic. And this is a three millimeter square area on the eye. We can see that in this eye, the foveal vascular zone is enlarged and there's areas of non-perfusion around the fovea. Here, actually, if we look at the on-FOS OCT, we can see that there's some subtle stria here and there's some dark spots and these correspond to this cyst that's shown on the structural OCT. So I like to look at the three millimeter scan to get details about the fovea. Next, this is the same eye looking at the six millimeter scan. We can still see that there's changes in the fovea, but now we can see there's some irregular blurring of the vessels here. And this shows on the on FOS here, and we can see there's stria. And this is from traction, okay? And also some traction up here. And we have the corresponding structural OCT. And then here's the 12 millimeter by 12 millimeter OCTA. And here we can identify that there's some abnormal retinal blood vessels here, here, also in this region with some capillary non-perfusion. And it looks like here there might be some traction. And this is actually evident on the on FOS where we see the regions of traction. They look dark because they're more elevated. And we can see the structural OCT down below confirming that there indeed is traction. Here's another diabetic eye looking at the different scan parameters. On the left here, we see the foveal details in the three by three millimeter scan. As we zoom out a bit in the six by six millimeter scan, we can still see the foveal avascular zone. Here's a small microaneurysm, but now we can see these regions of capillary dropout here, an irregular vascular loop here. And then in the 12 by 12 millimeter scan over here, we have more detail. And this is all, of course, accompanied with a structural OCT. So I like to start off with the end. So here are some take home points for my talk on proliferative diabetic retinopathy. First, IRMA and retinal neovascularization can be characterized and differentiated using wide field swept source OCTA combined with flow overlay. Another point is that wide field OCTA can accurately identify neovascularization that may not be evident on ultra wide field color fundus photography, and it's safer and faster than ultra wide field fluorescein angiography with comparable diagnostic accuracy. My third point is I think that this has great potential for diabetic retinopathy screening, 
and perhaps even classification system that might be analogous to the diabetic retinopathy severity score or even a new classification so we can better evaluate and treat eyes with high-risk diabetic retinopathy. So here's another case that I saw recently, and this patient came in and identified that within this little square here, there are some abnormal blood vessels. And you can see here's a close-up, and it's suspicious for neovascularization of the retina. So does this patient need to have a fluorescein angiogram? Well, I did a 12 by 12 OCTA, and I can see here that there is this region of neovascularization of the retina. So do I have all the information I know to know that this patient has proliferative diabetic retinopathy with extensive neovascularization of the retina and no center-involved macular edema? Well, another thing that I can do to confirm that this is neovascularization of the retina is that I can put my scan through that region. So here's multiple regions of abnormal blood vessels, and I can actually put my scan, so the OCTB scan or the structural OCT goes through that region, and I use this feature called flow overlay. And flow overlay places the OCTA signals onto the structural OCT. So here I can see that there is flow above the ILM above the retinal surface, and that is consistent with neovascularization of the retina. So doing this, I've confirmed that my patient has the findings that I thought without having to do fluorescein angiography. These are some of the findings that we found in a paper that was published in Retina last year. And what we did was we distinguished intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, which is also known as IRMA, from neovascularization of the retina using OCTA. And we were able to characterize quite a few features to help us use these diagnostically in the clinic. Just a little bit of background, why is it important to determine what IRMA is and differentiate this from retinal neovascularization? Well, IRMA was originally described as the standard photo 8A, 8B, which is up here on the right in the Early House classification. And it's described as tortuous, intraretinal vascular segments of variable caliber. And the reason IRMA is so important is that in the four to one rule that defines whether an eye has severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, IRMA represents one. So if you have one quadrant with IRMA, then you have severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and you have a high risk of progression to diabetic retinopathy. So these eyes need to be very carefully monitored. And on the occasional case, you might even treat at this stage in someone who, for example, had a progressive course in their contralateral eye. So it's a really important time to have patient education and talk to them about this and follow them closely. And the other thing is we don't know, there might be a relationship between IRMA and retinal neovascularization. Do they arise from the same etiology? And further information is really needed on this. So how have we been differentiating between IRMA and retinal neovascularization all of these years? Well, typically we do a fluorescein angiography and we also use features on clinical examination and spectral domain OCT. Some of the issues with differentiating them with what we have now is that IRMA can be very subtle. Fluorescein angiography is time consuming and there are risks. And there are some times when IRMA can leak a little bit on fluorescein angiography. It doesn't leak as much as very developed retinal neovascularization, but there's stages so it can be hard to differentiate. So there, there is possibly overlap in some cases. There have been some, feature, some other literature, and I just wanted to show, looking at IRMA versus neovascularization, looking at OCT, and looking at pathologic studies. And one thing that really seems to differentiate IRMA from retinal neovascularization is breach of the internal limiting membrane. 
And that goes along with our theories of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, that this happens when blood vessels breach the ILM and grow either on the vitreoretinal retinal surface or into the vitreous to cause tractional and hemorrhagic complications. So in our series, we did a prospective case series of eyes with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and these eyes were imaged with wide field OCT angiography, color fundus photography, and fluorescein angiography, which was the ground truth. We used the Zeiss Plex Elite 9000 swept source OCTA, and it has an acquisition speed of 100,000 A scans per second with an axial resolution of 6.3 microns, transverse resolution of 20 microns, and we were able to do these wide field scans to get our research protocol. Now, I just wanna show you how we obtained an image like this, because what we did was we used five 12 by 12 millimeter scans, and we were able to mosaic these together with software, and then we looked at the flow overlay. So this shows the scan protocol that we did, you can see on the left, there's five 12 by 12 millimeter scans. And on the right, these are all mosaic to give this amazing wide field picture. And you can see that in this eye, the patient does have these irregular foci of abnormal vessels with adjacent areas of capillary non-perfusion. So the next step in our methodology was to evaluate using a structural OCT scan through the regions of abnormal vessels. So you can see here on the left that we align the scan to produce the image on the right. So this is the corresponding structural OCT at this spot. And then we use something called the flow overlay, which I find very useful to evaluate my patients with diabetic retinopathy as well as choroidal neovascularization. And basically, it places the sum of the raw decorrelation signals from the OCTA image onto the co-registered structural OCT. So we can see here in this image that there is flow above the surface of the retina in this pre-retinal tissue. So these are our findings. Here's a case where the patient, we can see on the OCTA, there's this foci of abnormal blood vessels. And then on the flow overlay, we were able to confirm that this flow is confined to an intraretinal location. And while there might be a little bit of outpouching of the ILM, there is no extension and no breach through the ILM. And this is consistent with IRMA. And fluorescein angiography over here on the right, which was our ground truth, confirmed that this was IRMA. Here's another example. We can see on the left, here's an area that was identified on OCTA, an abnormal blood vessel. And then if we look at the corresponding structural OCT with flow overlay, this area did not extend through the ILM. It's intraretinal flow. And here on the fluorescein angiogram, we can see actually this area does have a little bit of late leakage. What about retinal neovascularization? Well, the features of retinal neovascularization that we noted were that there is super retinal flow that has breached the ILM and might even extend into the posterior hyloid on flow overlay. And we can see here on the upper right, here's the OCTA in the yellow square showing retinal neovascularization as well as in the blue square. And we can see on the flow overlay that the flow has breached the ILM and the fluorescein angiogram below corresponds to retinal neovascularization. One finding that we did note is that when eyes had retinal neovascularization that was associated clinically with fibrosis, there might be less prominent flow overlay and less prominent suprarenal flow. So on the bottom right, we see that there's some fibrosis in this eye with retinal neovascularization, confirmed with the fluorescein image here. Here's the OCTA image, and here is the structural OCT with flow overlay, and there is still some flow above the ILM, but it's not as prominent in the previous cases. Here's another example, same thing. This is clinically retinal neovascularization that had some fibrosis. We see the color fundus photograph and the fluorescein image on the left. 
And on the right, we see the OCTA on FOSS image. And here is the structural OCT with flow overlay showing there's flow above the retina, but less prominent than if there wasn't fibrosis. There were some cases where our fluorescein and OCTA did not match in the reading of the images, but overall OCTA was found to have a specificity of 99% and a sensitivity of 92%. And when these cases were adjudicated, it was thought that maybe the presence of fibrosis affected some of the reading of the image or that there might be a transitional phase from IRMA to retinal neovascularization in some of these eyes that were hard to determine, or there could be other sources of neovascularization. So this led us to look at IRMA in other ways. And I'm just gonna, in brief, tell you that we have proposed a classification system of IRMA because there's many variables in the clinical appearance. They can either appear as a dilated trunk, a loop, or a twisted loop. They can also appear as a, a C fan shape or having a net shape. And we've also evaluated the effect of anti-VEGF injection on IRMA. And it's been very variable. Sometimes IRMA appears to regress after anti-VEGF with some improvement of non-perfusion. But there are times when it can also appear to progress it might drop out completely or stay stable after anti-VEGF. So I think that there's a lot more research that can be done on this. So the next obvious step after characterizing retinal neovascularization and IRMA with OCT angiography was to look at wide field OCT angiography for the detection of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And can we be using this as a screening tool for our patients? And this is another publication that came out with Dr. Peachy this year that looked at and compared wide field OCT angiography to ultra wide field fluorescein angiography and ultra wide field color fundus photography to evaluate the ability of readers to detect retinal neovascularization and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So in this publication, we specifically focused on neovascularization of the disc and neovascularization elsewhere. And our findings were that wide field OCT angiography can accurately identify neovascularization that is not evident on color fundus photography, and it's faster and safer than ultra wide field fluorescein angiography with comparable diagnostic accuracy. This is showing some of the statistics from our publication and ultra wide field color fundus photography had a sensitivity of 35% for detection of neovascularization of the disc, and the detection rate of neovascularization elsewhere was about 31%. By contrast, ultra-wide field fluorescein angiography and wide field OCTA had sensitivities of 95 and 100% in detection of neovascularization of the disc, and a detection rate of 91% and 100% for neovascularization elsewhere. So this is pretty exciting to be able to detect all of these findings with a non-invasive test. Here's a patient from the study who had visible neovascularization of the disc, as we can see in the upper left. Here's the corresponding fluorescein angiogram, and here's the corresponding OCT angiogram. And we can see that here's very obvious neovascularization of the disc. And if we look at the flow overlay in this region, we can see that it's red here, consistent with vascular flow in that region. Here's also looking at some of the other regions on the right-hand side. Here's an area of neovascularization elsewhere that was seen clinically. Here's the fluorescein. Here's the OCTA. And down here, we can see the flow overlay that I really like to use in this scenario. Here's another patient. In this patient on color fundus photography, the neovascularization was not obvious to the readers. But if we look at the fluorescein angiography, it's obvious. And if we look at the OCTA, we can see the multiple foci of neovascularization. And the details are very visible because there's no leakage of dye. Here's another case where it was not obvious on color fundus photography, but we can see 
on the fluorescein angiogram that there's leakage. But one thing that's interesting is the degree of leakage. So if we look in the yellow circle here, we see between the early and the late, that is not very obvious. And the same in the red region, between the early and the late fluorescein, there's almost nothing seen. But OCTA here shows us that there's neovascularization elsewhere. And we can see here in the red circle, that's the flow overlay in that region. And there's obvious flow that has breached ILM and it's above the surface of the retina. Here's another case where we can see that the fluorescein angiogram between images B and C really doesn't show the neovascularization that corresponds to these regions on the OCTA. And here we can see in boxes red and yellow that there's neovascularization of the retina and that's confirmed with flow overlay. So our study conclusions were that with ultra wide field color fundus photography, neovascularization elsewhere might be masked by background retinovascular structures. With ultra wide field fluorescein, very immature or early neovascularization of the retina might not show leakage or it might be masked by hyperfluorescence of adjacent irma. By contrast, wide field OCTA is non invasive and it's a fast alternative and it seems to be very effective for detecting neovascularization elsewhere as well as neovascularization of the disc using the vitreoretinal interface slab. Let's look at some clinical cases. These are unedited images from my office. Here's a patient who had diabetic macular edema, and I wanted to show some of the images before and after anti-VEGF treatment. So the top image was prior to anti-VEGF treatment. The middle image is one month after anti-VEGF treatment, and the bottom image is three months after anti-VEGF treatment. So this is showing the three by three millimeter OCTA, and we can see at the top the superficial retina plexus here, and the changes are not as marked, but if we look at the deep retinal plexus here, we can see that there's these black cystic spaces, and this is typical of what we see in retinal cysts. There's these septum that separate the black spaces, and we can see that after one anti-VEGF treatment, these areas go away, but on the, after three months, there starts to be a small recurrence of edema over here. So this is an area where we can use that clinically to help us. This is the same patient looking at the six by six millimeter scan. And we can see that the changes are still there, but in less detail of the macular changes on the six by six, but more detail of the retina around that region. Here's another case I wanted to show you. This is a patient who had proliferative diabetic retinopathy as well as a branch retinal vein occlusion infrotemporally. And we can see on the OCTA, this is the 12 by 12 scan, that there's so much information here. This patient has areas of capillary non-perfusion, areas of neovascularization, and then an area of non-flow related to the retinal vein occlusion. Now, when I, I like to often try different scans because I'm trying to get the most information with the most efficient imaging that I can do. So this patient had a 12 by 12 scan, and then I did a 15 by nine scan. This is another scan I like to use often. And we can see here that it really highlights the ischemia and areas of non-flow infrotemporal to the fovea. And we can also see on the OCTA image, but even on the on FOSS, that there is a little bit of macular cystic change here in this region. Here's another patient that I saw, and this is more in line with what my present screening protocol is for patients who come in with diabetic retinopathy. I do a three by three millimeter scan, and I look at the fovea to evaluate whether they have macular edema, and then I decide which images on the left I wanna look at, but here, this is looking at the superficial plexus. And then I do a wider scan, either a 12 by 12 or a 15 by 15 scan to look at the peripheral retina 
in this view to see if there's any signs of capillary dropout or retinal neovascularization. So in conclusion, Irma, retinal neovascularization, and neovascularization of the disc can be reliably characterized and differentiated using wide field swept source OCTA combined with the depth encoded flow overlay. And one of the benefits besides that it's non-invasive and there's no dye involved is that adjacent non-perfusion is not obscured by dye leakage. I think that this has a lot of potential to play a role in screening and management of our diabetic patients. And it might even lead to a classification system in addition to the diabetic retinopathy severity scales where we can classify patients based on the changes that we see on OCT and geography and the response that they have to current therapies. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to this talk today. And I'd be interested in answering any questions regarding this topic.